My guest today is Paul Andres. Paul is a professor of economics at Harvard University. He's a renowned international trade economist. His most recent work has focused on the analysis of global value chains and on the interplay between trade, inequality, and redistribution. Hello, Paul. It's really great to have you here and, and to be able to talk about, about all this interesting work you've been doing on trade and, and globalization and what's going on with the global order. Uh, thanks, thanks, thanks for thanks for coming. Thanks, Luis. Thanks for the for the. So, so um, uh, the first thing I want to talk about is after uh, is about uh, the globalization. You've been uh, writing and thinking a lot about it, and we've been all kind of worrying with the Trump administration, which wasn't really such a huge change over the, the previous one, probably in this way. The sense that we have entered a new phase uh, in, in the in the in the era of, of international relationship of trade uh, that m basically means that trade is not growing as much as it was that it's slowing down or even the trend towards globalization is reversing. What what do the data tell us and what's your sense about what what's going on? Yeah, so I mean, I think my sense is that the case for a slowdown in globalization, what the economist has called the slowbalization uh, process, I think the case is very clear. Um, um, that is, if you look at various measures of uh, globalization, they grew incredibly fast uh, in the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s. And then the Great Recession came and they kind of stagnated. Um, you know, there's some exceptions, migrations, Migration is at an all-time high. You might debate whether, you know, refugees uh, are part of the story there. Uh, capital flows are down relative to their peak in the Great Recession. But again, there might be some idiosyncratic aspects with uh, with capital markets that might explain that um, retrenching. Uh, on the trade flow side, world trade flows as a percentage of world GDP, they're basically you know, they went down dramatically at the Great Recession, quickly recovered, and they've been pretty much stagnant since then. Okay, so the process of growth has slowed down. So, yes, if you're a commentator and you have uh, an agenda of claiming, you know, there's deglobalization, you're going to be able to pick one or two indicators that are going to show that. But my sense is that when you put all the things together, uh, you know, even if there might be some indications that we might be enter entering a phase of deglobalization, we, we certainly have not uh, at this point. I think there's the risk of it happening, but but um, but I don't see very clear signs of that having happened. Um, when, when we think about the drivers and, 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 and what, what the policy side or the politics side is, um, one, one preliminary question I wanted to pose you. When Danny Roderick was here, uh, and you've heard him say it, uh, for sure many times uh, he basically is making the case that we have overstated the benefits of globalization in, in many ways do you think this is right do you think economists have kind of hyped globalization too much that that the world has integrated too rapidly too fast or do you think that that there there is a case basically that remains for integration in all these dimensions you've been you've been mentioning so so you know i i agree with many things that danny then he writes. I, I don't agree with everything he says, but I agree with many of the things he writes. But the way I would characterize it on, on this particular thing is, is I don't think that we have necessarily overhyped the benefits of globalization. Uh, you know, when I think about what trade integration has done to countries like China and even some African economies where globalization has lifted millions and millions of individuals out of poverty. Um, I, I, I don't think that we have necessarily overhyped that. What we have done, and Danny has written about this and I fully agree with, is that perhaps we have not been sufficiently clear on the downsides of globalization, uh, both on the academic side in the sense of, uh, uh, you know, providing that is sort of this very plain vanilla trade is good type of narrative without uh, um, you know, emphasizing that the same models that tell us that trade is good tell us that trade will almost surely be bad for certain individuals in society. Um, but more importantly, I think on the policy side, uh, there hasn't been enough to actually try to make sure that this large gains that uh, relate to uh, globalization are, are evenly or, or 
not too unevenly spread in a way that it's going to lead some people to feel alienated uh, by the process. Now, Danny might go to the extreme to say, you know, there perhaps is an optimal level of globalization and uh, we might have overshot it. Um, I mean, I'm not, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but I mean, uh, if not him, there's some, certainly some folks that have made that claim. There, I'm a little bit less clear in the sense that, you know, I think there is a good reason that given how we have managed the process, we might have overshot an optimal level, but that's sort of a, what we call a second best argument. That is perhaps uh, there is, you know, the, the scope for more globalized, even more globalization to be beneficial for the world economy, as long as we find ways to tackle the downsides of it. We have uh, perhaps more progressive tax systems in certain countries that uh, like the US where in during the process of increased inequality in the 70s and 80s and 90s, if anything, tax progressivity went down and we find, you know, we start using more proactively uh, active labor market policies that does do a better job of relocating workers that get mm -hmm. um, dislocated by trade shock. So, uh, you know, I, in the absence of those direct mechanisms, perhaps uh, there is an optimal level of globalization, but, you know, I always picture Jack Bhagwati shouting in my ear saying, you know, that's, you know, this is not an issue about trade. It's an issue about redistribution. It's an issue of, tackling the downsides, that's what you should do, right? Uh, you, you don't want to shut down trade. That's the, the, the first best way to approach this is to tackle the problem. So you, you have in the past divided the, the drivers of the of the globalization into, into three. And, and uh, I, I would like you to, to go through that and, and tell us kind of how each one of those drivers has been evolving. First driving the globalization and then potentially now uh, potentially not, or in some cases, uh, yes. So technology, policy, and politics. Uh, do, do you want to tell us how you see information and technology revolution to start uh, with one uh, has driven this, this process and, and what's, what's going on now? Absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's, I think that's the way to go if you want to try to understand exactly the globalization, you want to understand how we got here and, and whether the drivers that brought us here, you know, why they have stalled and, and whether they might work in reverse. So, on the technology side, um, you know, the ICT revolution, as you, as you well know uh, from your own work on the topic, um, the, the ICT revolution was, was a very dramatic uh, uh, shock for the organization of production, both in terms of how firms organize production and, and hierarchies, et cetera, like your uh, path-breaking work uh, showed, but also from the point of view of, of international economics, um, it basically allowed firms to much more efficiently organize production at long distances. And, um, and basically firms that initially had, you know, their whole production process was perhaps in Spain or in Germany or in the UK, they realized, hey, there's some workers uh, far uh, that get paid much lower wages, they're quite efficient, and, you know, we can actually tell them what we want them to do. And they can, we can communicate with them, we can send them designs, and, you know, perhaps it's not as ideal as having them in, you know, the next town over, uh, but they're, they're providing such a cost advantage that it's beneficial to do that. So what that led is, is for a much larger uh, demand for foreign labor and, and combining it with local labor. That's the technological driver and it's sort of driven by computerization, increased uh, power of computers, increased uh, speed of uh, uh, communication, uh, you know, through fiber optic cables um, and so on and so forth. That's on the technology side. Um, and then we can you know, talk about more no new technologies that sort of are the offspring of those. Maybe we can talk about that later, Luis. Um, on the policy side, um, you know, remember all this is happening largely in the eighties and nineties. Yes, of course, computers came up earlier and so on, but the moment they like, start being used in businesses uh, and have an impact on the economy is really 80s and, and 90s. Uh, during the same period, what's happening on the policy front? Well, for international trade, you know, it's great to be able to combine your uh, labor with labor abroad, but if you find it expensive to ship goods across borders, mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's going to limit the, that process. Um, but both on the technology side uh, for shipping, especially on the, on the, on the trade policy side, 
this is a period of a very marked trade liberalization. Um, at the multilateral level, most of it happened earlier, but at the regional level, I mean, you know, I don't need to tell you, Spain, Portugal, Greece enter the EU in 86. There's an expansion to, uh, uh, to Eastern European countries in the 90s. This was huge fragmentation of production in Europe. In the US, NAFTA is signed in 94. Uh, Mercosur is signed in 93, I believe, in mid 90s. The Asian mm -hmm. FTA is signed around that period. And then you have, uh, in two th you know, starting in the 90s, but especially 2001, that's when China enters the WTO and that basically enters the world trading system. These are all large policy shocks that basically at the same time that people found it easier to communicate at long distances, they found it much cheaper to also uh, ship goods across borders. And then the last point is, uh, it's one of policy is politics, which is, you know, it's it's the fall of uh, communism in Eastern Europe. It's uh, it's Deng Xiaoping opening the Chinese economy in '79. It's India's liberalization in the '90s. All these are politic political shocks, call them, um, that obviously made it increase massively increase the amount of labor or the type of you know the the, the number of workers that were available for this process of globalization. So you have labor demand shocks, labor supply shocks, they worked in together to generate this very marked uh, increase in fragmentation. So that's, to me, that's obviously there's other things that were happening around that period. Uh, I'm not saying it's one third, one third, one third. To some people, uh, the ICT revolution was most of it. To other people, it was China. So we could put numbers on that. But I think these are sort of the key things to understand how we got to 2008 with a significantly larger amount of openness that, that we had in say the early 70s. And then from that moment onwards, some of, all, of those forces, or even several of those forces in your view stopped pushing. Uh, what, what, what changed uh, with, the, with the crisis and with the, with the last period? Yeah, so, so many things. I mean, I think on the technology front, um, a lot of these technologies started reaching diminishing returns. So. You might say Moore's law for uh, uh, semiconductors is still going strong, but we know from work by Bloom and co-authors that um, that's uh, happening at an increasingly uh, high cost. Okay, so it's it's becoming harder and harder to innovate. Um, um, so on the technology front, I'd say we might have reached some diminishing returns. I'm actually don't think that technology had much to do with it, actually, because there's also other new technologies, and we can talk about those later if you want, that I think are giving, uh, on their own, they're giving globalization a second a second win or third win, however you want to think about waves of globalization. Mention, mention them now, I think this, this is right to, 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 to mention them. Ah, yeah. So, so I mean, on the, on the one hand, there's it's fairly uncontroversial, I think, the digital platforms, um, you know, that they're and it's, it's an offspring of the ICT revolution, but they're sort of somewhat distinct. They've been quite uh, important in, in, in enhancing uh, trade. It's not Amazon, it's not just uh, being super important in this day and age for us to be able to ride this pandemic and, and, uh, and, and continue to kind of uh, meet our needs. Um, but, but also in an international business setting, you know, all these platforms have business to business uh, sides of it. And it's they're used by firms that want to get something from suppliers. They need to find suppliers and these rating systems. Everything we rely on when we go to Amazon and and buy stuff. This is actually quite helped a lot uh, companies as well. So digital platforms um, um, also for service provision. I think for certain less developed economies that uh, have uh, suffered from having bad infrastructure that had has limited their ability to participate in global value chains. Now they find themselves that, you know, even if they don't have hard infrastructure, as long as they have a good digital infrastructure, um, they can actually get a food in value chains, maybe providing certain types of services that can be provided digitally. So I think for digital platforms is fairly uncontroversial. For blockchain, all this sort of distributed uh, uh, ledgers, this is all coming now. So there's a lot of uncertainty as to how big they are. There's a lot of overhype. Uh, but there is a sense that blockchain, by facilitating payments, uh, maybe leading to better enforcement of contracts, might actually reduce transaction costs. And particularly for transactions where more formal contracting 
is lacking, which is typical in international transactions. Have you seen any evidence of that already, or is this is this something we are expecting? Uh, have you already seen applications where it's actually doing it? No, I, I uh, so I have not, um, mm -hmm. and and that's why I say I, you know, I I like to base my my arguments on conceptual, you know, conceptual. Yeah evidence, meaning it makes sense that this will happen, but also yes. empirical evidence. Mm -hmm. Some of the mm -hmm. things that I'm about to tell you about have a bit of both. Uh, in this mm -hmm. particular case, uh, I've seen a lot of analysis about why blockchain might help and which way it might help. There's a lot of work about its limitations, um, mm -hmm. its its uh, impact on the environment, for instance. So there's a lot of debates, uh, but they're mostly, as far as I can tell at this point, uh, conceptual. There might be somebody who might have crunched some numbers um, yes. But I, 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 I think we don't know. We don't know a lot. We but certainly, these are things that, if they are to be operating, they're likely. We we kind of know which way they're going to operate. That is, they they're, they're going to tend to reduce transaction costs. How much mm -hmm. we don't know. Now, more controversially, um, you know, think about automation, or mm -hmm. uh, you know, automation industrial robots, or even three D printing. I think there's a general sentiment out there that these are things that are likely to really fuel deglobalization. And the argument mm -hmm. appears to make a lot of sense, which is, you know, in the same way that industrial robots have been replacing workers in the factories that have automated. And there's a lot of evidence that this uh, labor replacing uh, uh, forces in play, Asimoglu, mm -hmm. who you had here, as a bunch of work on this, and, and, and there's a lot of empirical evidence that that's happening. You might say, well, if that's the case, then obviously it's going to be replacing foreign labor, so it's going to be undoing this process of uh, global value chain formation. If we went to China because wages were lower, but now we're not using workers anymore, we're using robots, we might as well stay in, in, uh, um, in California. There's no reason mm -hmm. to actually have production in China. So my view there is, is different. And it's it, first on the conceptual front is not that obvious um, that this is necessarily true. That's part of the story. There's certainly a substitution effect. Uh, but robots also uh, tend to increase firm productivity big time, right? You, you basically uh, automate, you can scale up very easily or much more easily. You, you know, if you do so, you're reducing costs. If you're switching from mm -hmm. foreign labor to automation, you're reducing costs. That's going to increase your productivity. It's going to increase your optimal scale of production. And remember uh, that robots do not produce things out of thin air. You know, very often automation is, is, is used for assembly. Mm -hmm. so you're bringing stuff and instead of having workers do it, that you have all these like massive robots putting the cars together. You still need the parts. And some of the parts might be automated, but maybe many, many are not. So to the extent that many of the parts that are going into production are actually going to be using labor, and to the extent that there's still comparative advantage and some of those things are produced abroad, you have this productivity effect, which basically tells you that as firms become more productive, they might increase the demand for inputs, and they might increase the demand for uh, foreign inputs, imported inputs. So this productivity effect, it actually... Conceptually, it could be quite large. And empirically, it is. We kind of knew that in other settings. So um, in my own work, for instance, I've looked at offshoring. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, well, in, in our own joint, joint work as well. But um, I have a more recent paper uh, that looked at uh, with, with Teresa Ford and Felix Tintelnot that looked at US data on US firms that offshored. And you might have thought those US firms that offshored, they basically took some jobs or, or some input purchases that were done locally in the US and they, they started buying from China. And in the data, what you actually see, uh, even accounting for by sort of concerns, empirical concerns you might have about endogeneity and so on, uh, you basically see that firms that offshore to China, if anything, they tended to increase their uh, intermediate input purchases from local US suppliers, from Mexican suppliers, from German suppliers. This complementarity is that come from the fact that if you offshore to China, you increase your productivity, you increase your optimal scale, and then you basically demanded more inputs from everywhere. That we saw in the data. More recently, folks that have looked at automation, firms that automate, what happens to them after they automate, Asimoglu and co-authors are absolutely right. Local labor 
uh, you know, unskilled labor goes down by these firms or, you know, employment more generally. But when you look at offshoring or uh, purchases of intermediate inputs, if anything, those go up after uh, processes of automation. So that tells me that, yes, automation is going to readjust things. It's going to reorganize production. But I don't see why it's going to necessarily uh, lead to deglobalization because it, it, it's going to increase efficiency. And to the extent that we still need parts and materials from abroad, those, the demand for those things uh, might actually go up rather than down as, you know, Stapleton and Webb have shown uh, with Spanish data, actually, as folks uh, at the World Bank, Artuk and co-authors that have shown that with industry level data, uh, every single study that I've seen on automation and uh, trade uh, shows complementarity. So that's why, um, although conceptually it could go either way, I, I do think actually that technology is gonna continue to foster uh, globalization. So, so the technology picture is 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 clear, or at least uh, there there is a path uh, forward towards uh, globalization. There, what about policy? Uh, do you think that we're gonna we're going to continue after this slowdown uh, to to liberalize in the way that you were suggesting on the first phase of of, of, of hyper globalization, or um, this this? I mean, it's hard to tell, right? But but it does seem like in many places this, this progress is blocked. Yes, so I, I here's where I would agree with, with Danny. I mean, we've, we've touched on that before, which is, I do think that, I mean, it's undeniable that there, there are growing concerns about a protectionist turn in, um, in, in, the, in policy. I mean, from, um, you know, from, the Doha round at the WTO that's been going on for over a decade and very little progress. Um, Imagine if you get that job. Huh? <laughs> Imagine if you get that job yes. to be one of those ambassadors. It's... Exactly. I mean, we don't have a director general at the WTO since, yeah. you know, for what, four months? I mean, clearly there's been a process of erosion, not just the institution has basically stopped making progress, but there's been a lot of erosion of its, uh, of the architecture on which it was based. So that's particularly worrisome. Even at the regional side, um, you know, you've also witnessed Brexit uh, firsthand, right? So that it's just taking everything that was happening in the 80s and 90s that I was telling you about before, expansion of the European Union, regional trade integration, and it's basically taking a step back. Yeah. Uh, in the US, uh, the USMCA, which is the new NAFTA, you know, uh, it, it's a small change, small, you know, modification of NAFTA, but if anything, it's, it's a step back. Um, and then let alone the, this US-China trade war, which, um, you know, these things are, okay, we're not, you know, WTO regionally, it's like we're, we're not moving forward, we're kind of going back a little bit, and, but this is an all-out trade war that has increased average tariffs in the US and China to very significant levels, levels we had not seen in decades. So, so all this is telling me that obviously there, there's something happening. Then for a long time, we were thinking, you know, the US-China trade war is just bargaining and they're just sort of taking a strong stance. And this is all at some point we're gonna hear they're gonna sign a deal and it's all mm -hmm. over. But I think we're a little bit past that. And then we're a little bit past that because I think we also understand better that this is not about um, uh, Trump in, um, in the US or, you know, um, Orban in, Orban is in Hungary or Hungary. Yeah. Hungary or, or, uh, uh, the, the Brexiters in the UK that just crazy people that for some reason, uh, not crazy people, but, uh, yeah, idiosyncratic yeah. people, uh, yeah, that for yeah. whatever reason were elected and then they decided to do that. No, we need to understand why they were elected. Okay. And clearly there was growing disillusionment and discontent over globalization. And I think in, in great, great part is because what, of what I mentioned before, which is that, uh, trade increased aggregate income, but it also increased inequality a lot. And, and a lot of people were not experiencing. Uh, or did not perceive that they were experiencing um, the gains from globalization. I think there's a whole set of behavioral issues if we could, you know, at some point talk about uh, maybe in another session, but on like 
how people perceive the benefits. And I think very often they might be underestimating the benefits from globalization. But for what, you know, whatever reason, there's clearly a lot of alienation, a lot of folks that felt that this is actually not working for us. And the worry I have is that if that's what's led us here, I don't see that going away anytime soon. That is, uh, even if globalization, you know, we write this policy uncertainty somehow, the Biden administration sort of in the US and maybe in the next UK elections, there's a t I mean, I could imagine a scenario where uh, um, different political parties are in power and they try to push for things. There's gonna be a lot of backlash because if we are to see an increase in globalization, even if I'm right about robots and things like that, these are technologies that even though they might increase globalization, they're almost certainly gonna continue to increase inequality. These are skilled bias, technological change. It's somewhat different, but if anything, it's even worse for unskilled workers. So unless, and unless we find ways to better compensate the losers to reduce that alienation, uh, um, we're gonna be in trouble. And, and you might say, well, why don't we do that? Well, you know, are we, you know, is the Biden administration in the US, for instance, gonna be able to do much? Well, it's, it's hard to be optimistic, right? At this point they're yes, they won, but they don't control the Senate. So it's very unlikely that in the next four years, um, much is gonna change on that front. So, you know, anytime you try to predict the future, you need to be a bit cautious, but um, that's where I'm really worried. And arguably I'm much less worried today than I was early in November before the election, where I did think that if Trump won that election, we, you know, you know that the, the situation was gonna be really, really worrisome. I'm a little bit less worried, but I do think that the underlying forces are, are, are continue to be here. So, so, so let me change uh, uh, a little bit topics and ask you about one of, one of the uh, main areas of, of your work as well, which is, has been the, the reconfiguration of the way trade has taken place. And, and I, I want to go a little bit further, kind of a little bit more generally uh, and, and not, not necessarily focus on the trends to, to think about exactly what is different about trade now from several hundred years ago? So when economists were talking about trade in the past, they were thinking, and many people think about trade, we are selling wine, uh, we're buying textiles like David Ricardo. And, and you have been very much uh, focusing on how trade has, has changed uh, lately and how we are seeing radically different patterns where we see trade within companies and between companies, uh, value chains within value chains, how is trade different and what is the implication that these different patterns of trade, this different form that trade uh, uh, takes for the uh, growth of the economies, inequality, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, so, I mean, this is, this is a large topic, but, you know, as a matter of a background, I mean, how I got into this is, is as you know, you know, the, the trade field obviously borrows a lot from, from Ricardo and a lot of the insights and David Ricardo's uh, 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 work uh, continue to kind of permeate the field. But since the last couple of decades, um, the field has basically had a big focus on, on firm level approaches to trade. Um, meaning, yes, obviously uh, you go to national statistics and Spain exports this amount of these goods and they import this amount of these goods, but it's not really countries that export or import. These are firms that are deciding to not just sell locally, but they go and export uh, uh, to foreign markets. Mm -hmm. um, there are firms that are deciding to not just produce from using inputs from local suppliers, but they go to China, they go to Bulgaria and they try to find suppliers. This is, to me, this is how it works. Then obviously it aggregates up. Um, but uh, what the field has been arguing and showing um, is that, you know, when you start at the micro level and have models of firm level decisions and aggregate up to the economy, you actually get a lot of insights. It's, it's, it's not just the obvious way to think about firm level trade, but it actually turns out to be the right way to think about country level trade. Uh, if you don't do it that way, you miss a lot of things. So in that vein, you know, um, when you start thinking about firms, and, and, and trade and firms and globalization, you realize that exporting is one aspect that is important, but 
a very large percentage of world trade is accounted for by very large multinational companies that not only produce domestically and export, but they have, you know, plans in a bunch of countries that, uh, that assemble goods. They buy parts and components from many countries. They have very, very complex uh, uh, supply chains. And because they're very large, you know, when we think about what constitutes, you know, what explains U.S. imports, or what explains U.S. exports, we might not always only want to think about U.S. companies that, you know, decide to export or they decide to import. You might want to think about the fact that one of the largest importers and exporters in the U.S. might be a firm like Toyota, which is not a, a U.S. company based, uh, U.S. based company, um, and whose decisions in the U.S. are clearly uh, interdependent with their decisions in Japan and their decisions in Europe. Um, and, and the same with Ford. Ford is a large uh, uh, a company in the US, but it has very large operations in Europe and other parts of the globe. And all these things are interrelated for obvious reasons. So a lot of what I've been trying to do is, you know, how can we make sense of this strategies of companies and, uh, and how do they aggregate and, and what are the new things that, um, that come out of it? Obviously, you know, you, you may argue that the world is more complex than the models that we typically write, but that's not by itself sufficient to convince people that we need to switch to other models. You need to tell them how those previous models get things wrong. And here, I mean, there's a variety of things that I've, that I've worked with. I've, I've already alluded to, to at least one of them, which is this result on the complementarity between offshoring and domestic sourcing. Uh, if you have a traditional framework in mind, import competition is basically going to substitute uh, uh, domestic uh, uh, purchases for foreign ones. The China shock is something that created a very dramatic negative impact on US manufacturing. Yes, that's part of the story, but it is also true that the China shock, a lot of what was imported from China, uh, were not final goods, uh, they're parts and components. And that basically allowed you, some US companies to grow and expand and their expansion actually had a positive effect on, on U.S. manufacturing. So it, it, this sort of more subtle complex effects basically tell us that, you know, the effects of certain policies uh, might be uh, different than, than otherwise uh, thought. Or, you know, when you have tariffs, you might want to be very careful about are these tariffs going to apply to consumer goods or are they also going to apply to inputs? Because if you have a tariff worth war with China, you're not only producing your uh, steel industry in the US, but you're also making steel more expensive for automakers in the US. And that basically is a negative impact on them. So there's all this sort of wealth of more complex, but I think very realistic and empirically powerful mechanisms that traditional approaches tend to leave under the rug that I think we can't leave under the rug. And we cannot leave them under the rug, particularly now because we, there's huge demand for reliable counterfactuals. What is the China, US-China trade war doing to the US? Is it a good thing? Uh, like uh, President Trump was arguing and theoretically at some level it made sense that you could sort of redirect activity to the US, generate um, US employment and even benefit US aggregate income through those uh, uh, unilateral tariffs. Uh, but in a world of global value chains, uh, it's not so obvious. And the evidence seems to suggest that indeed that has not been beneficial, beneficial for US manufacturing. So that's basically in, in very broad terms, uh, the agenda here, trying to have models that I think get at realistic features that are likely to matter. And they're likely to matter because they capture the operations of humongous companies in the world economy that are gonna drive aggregates. And even if you don't care about aggregates, Maybe you, if you understand broadly what 50, the 50, the largest 100 companies in the, US, in, in the world do, you're actually going to have a very large share of trade flows explained. So that's uh, basically what I'm after. So, so in Europe, many people look at this, particularly post-COVID, and they feel uncomfortable. You see a renaissance, I guess, of industrial policy. People, people look at this and they say, well, uh, it makes us, we want the strategic independence or strategic sovereignty. It makes us dependent on other countries. What if, you know, in the same way as happened with respirators and with masks, if the value chain starts somewhere uh, that we don't really trust, is this going to eventually lead to um, being, you know, the next crisis being out of certain things, right? Uh, being exposed uh, 
to other countries hold up, to other countries abusing us, etc. Um, and this is kind of one of the drivers that we see here when, when we do policy in Europe. We see uh, driving many people to reconcile industrial policy. People are thinking, oh, we should make sure that we have a homegrown industry in this and that areas, etc. What is your sense about the fragility of the global value uh, change, uh, chain construction and the extent to which it exposes countries to potential holdups, etc.? I mean, I, I, I think this is something that obviously needs to be taken into account. It can be discarded. Um, I always give that example. I mean, there's, you know, if we push the globalization argument to its limits, we might uh, conclude that um, if, we, if, for instance, Spain wants to have the best possible army it could have, we should just offshore this to the Chinese, okay? So we're just gonna have to tell the Chinese <laughs> government to run our army. That's a good okay? argument. Um, now that sounds silly, okay? And it is silly, uh, but, but it gets at the issue of national security. Um, and then we've had discussion about, you know, but we, we've had discussions in the US on, about ports uh, or there's issues with airports, right? I mean, I, I imagine when Heathrow was sold to this consortium that was uh, where Spain had a large uh, share of ownership. I mean, that's certainly, I'm sure generated some debates as to whether that was something that was um, that was appropriate or not. So I'm very sympathetic uh, to this notion and I do believe there is a line to be drawn. Now the issue is where you draw that line and that that I, I get very uneasy about, right? Because, um, you know, now we've had uh, with respirators and all this stuff, we we're saying, there's some essential goods that need to be produced locally um, because if we rely on trade, um, we cannot assure uh, supply. So, so that makes some sense, but then I would push back and say, yes, that's true, but you know, uh, how do you know that they're gonna be uh, provided more efficiently domestically? Take one example. In the US in, in March and April, when, when the current health crisis was taking off, there were basically two goods that were hard to get in um, in supermarkets. One was um, toilet paper. Toilet paper. There's a more uh, a, <laughs> a, it's a, incredible. A proper way to put the term, but the toilet paper was hard, and meat meat was hard to find. Okay. Huh. Um, turns out that more than ninety percent of of U.S. consumption of these two goods is is local. Okay. Yes, we import meat. Yes, we import toilet paper, but the bulk of it is produced locally. And and those were the, if you will, the value chains that were creating more uh, uh, problems. So if the argument is really about assuring a provision in times of crisis, um, I'm I'm not entirely sure um, that moving them closer is is necessarily going to deal with it. And at the same time with respirators with masks and so on. I mean, we have seen uh, a lot of willingness from country, you know, China has been sending planes with lots of stuff. Uh, you know, Germany took some patients from Belgium, you know this very well, I'm sure uh, in recent weeks. So I, you know, I, I'm, I'm not quite sure where to draw the line and how much I would encourage governments to try to kind of reshore more based on national security. But there are serious concerns, the army stuff, you know, cyber security uh, with China, you know, um, that's a very, very, very uh, significant uh, issue um, that needs regulation or that needs monitoring. Uh, I'm very sympathetic to that, um, but it's not, um, it's not a panacea and, you know, anytime you open the door for this type of reshoring or government action, the issue is where you draw the line and, and, and it's, uh, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to know exactly where. So one reassuring thing is that trade flows and, and, and uh, international exchanges have recovered in spite of all these, uh, you would imagine the lack of mobility would have, would have uh, stopped that. But in fact, trade is, is pretty much back. Is, is that not? Absolutely, yes. So that, um, and th that is uh, very much uh, related to some of the things that we've already talked about. I think the fact that uh, a big chunk of world trade is associated with 
a few hundred companies that are large and they have complex global value chains. When the crisis came, things came to a halt, but they didn't reorganize things massively. They didn't sort of start changing uh, suppliers very dramatically. So when things went back to normal, they could sort of scale up again. Um, and, and so, and this is not just now. I mean, we know that from previous studies that looked at the Great Recession um, or pre previous studies that looked at the Asian financial crisis. Um, these are large shocks, but even when those very large shocks happen, very often we don't see international links getting, you know, being broken up. Um, people sort of stuck, stuck they, they stick together and they try to write it out. And the reason for that is because there are, it's very complex to set up this value change. We can think that, you know, the current crisis has um, led companies to reassess what they should be doing. Maybe we should move out of China and set up company, you know, plants in our own country. But then they crunch numbers and they realize it's very expensive. They need to kind of build new plants, new equipment. And, and it's, there's such large scale economies that it's very, it's very costly to uh, move things around. And, um, and I, you know, I, I must confess, I mean, uh, uh, you might remember back uh, in 2008, 2009, when, when the crisis was hitting, um, you and I were in Oviedo uh, uh, for a ceremony where you gave a very nice speech. Um, for your price, uh, for uh, your price uh, and, to the best and, economies at the forty. It was the first time I was talking, probably the first time I was talking to the press. So I was all like uh, feeling pretty uh, um, sure of myself. And, and I was telling the press, this is gonna sh this is gonna be a big shock to the world economy. And we're gonna see depressed trade flows for the next five, 10 years, because it's so hard to create those links that now that all this crisis is breaking things up, don't expect things to kind of reappear like super quickly because firms are going to have to find new suppliers, it's going to take time and it's going to be a slow recovery. And then, you know, six months later, I was looking like a fool because things kind of picked up very quickly. And what I had missed is, is that, that firms are not dumb. They re realize that resetting this value change is very costly. So they just held together. If supplier was in trouble, they would extend the line of credit just to keep things alive so that when things go back to normal, you can scale up. And that's exactly what, uh, what we saw in the data when looking at micro data. A couple of years later, people started looking at micro data, the, what we call the extensive margin, uh, the trade links did not move much. It was all an intensive margin, shock down, and then back up. Uh, for the current uh, COVID crisis, it's a bit early to tell, but um, Asier Minondo, who is a Spanish economist, has looked at Spanish data and it's found, again, that things have moved back up very quickly because the adjustment has been 95% at the intensive margin. So, so, so I, I, I do think that, um, I do think that uh, it takes very large and persistent shocks to lead to reorganization of production. And the, uh, not even the Great Recession it was, I think policy shocks that are likely to persist are uh, uh, gonna lead to this. Uh, but COVID to me, and, and especially at this point, it looks like something that in a year, uh, we're out of it for sure. This is very interesting. It's a, it's a good point to, to finish on. Your, your sense that um, the economy, the global economy, particularly the, the links between countries and inside companies in between companies are more robust than people could fear. And that in some sense, could I interpret what you're saying as uh, this, the wounds of this terrible 2020 uh, might be less persistent and, and less deep in terms of if assuming we get a vaccine and all those health things that we can't, we can't ourselves as economists predict, but they look good right now, uh, you would expect things to return pretty much to normal, in, at least in, in all this area of, of trade and manufacturing and, and the trade links. Uh, yes, on, on a direct account of the crisis, the crisis is dramatic um, and, and it's like, it's depressing to see what's happening. But in terms of world trade, I mean, I have no doubt that by the end of the year, or by the end even of next next year, world trade over world GDP uh, will be higher than it was at the beginning of this year. And in part because of the fast recovery of trade flows, and in part because services that are less tradable um, are going to take longer to re to recover. Um, so I'm 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 quite sure about this. Now, I wouldn't discount 
the effect that COVID will have in the medium to long term uh, on account of at least two forces. On the one hand, you know, um, I think international, international business travel will not go back to normal anytime soon, in part because of uh, people are scarred or they realize they can do things remotely that they didn't do before. Uh, and in part because the, you know, we'll see how the airlines come out of it. And I don't think international travel will be uh, anywhere as pleasant or uh, <laughs> not too unpleasant as, as, uh, um, as it was in the past. Um, and second, because of um, this is a this is a crisis that has uh, aggravated a lot of the underlying forces that created discontent with globalization. Uh, inequality is on the rise. Uh, this is a shock that is affecting much more individuals that relied on face-to-face interactions in the service provision, restaurants, bars, etc. All these are the people that are suffering the most. And there's an international dimension to. The shock. It, it, I mean, it seems undeniable that uh, it originated in China and that created a lot of um, bad uh, feelings and sort of tensions. And it doesn't help that mm. certain presidents call it the Wuhan or China virus. Mm. Um, so there's increased policy tensions, uh, and then there's kind of underlying backlash coming from increased inequality, even in the EU. I mean, this is not just about Brexit. You're you're right there in the middle of it, and I'm sure. Maybe you can't say this here, but I'm sure you've experienced uh, a much more tense environment now than you did at the beginning of the year. Um, there was a lot of, uh, you know, back and forth on the passing of the relief package, and and it's it's I imagine it's 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 hard to be super optimistic about uh, the ability of uh, of countries to kind of go back to a more amicable type of interactions, but. Um, but we'll see. I mean, once we have a vaccine, I mean, we'll also see how we all walk out of this and, and what what is. I the... was thinking last week that uh, I don't know if this is too early, but that this will be the summer of our lives when we are allowed to go out and hug our yeah. families. And I mean, we're going to just go wild. I don't know the whole world. I don't mean us, but just everybody. I don't know. But that's that's what I'm imagining. The, the crazy, happy 20s. A lot of pent up demand for social. Yeah. A lot. <laughs> Thank you very much, Paul. It was really a pleasure to talk to you. I really, I really enjoyed it, and I hope our our uh, our viewers uh, did as well. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Luis. Un abrazo.